Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world, education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism, alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Newspapers are struggling while large media companies buy them up and downsize. Indiana isn't safe from the rapid change in the industry. Ten southern Indiana newspapers were bought up this week and six employees of the media group were let go. The popular exhibit Columbus, a series of art and architectural installations all over the city, has chosen the five designs that will anchor this year's exhibit. And reporter Barbara Brozier sits down with the new Scott County Sheriff who is aggressively going after drug dealers and users. We want to be able to drive down the street and see kids playing in their front yards and see kids playing on playgrounds. Uh, that's, that's the ultimate goal. And we want to be able to see uh, people out walking down the sidewalks. But some worry that stepped up enforcement could impact rehabilitation efforts. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, the company that owns the Bloomington Herald Times and nine other newspapers in southern Indiana has sold its publishing department to Gatehouse Media. As Alex Eady reports, the transition in ownership could mean an increased focus on digital media and potential cutbacks for staff. When Bob Zaltzberg stepped up to the podium at this week's Bloomington Press Club's monthly luncheon, he knew he wouldn't be able to stick to his prepared remarks. You know, everybody makes mistakes. The, the day that I, you know, wander in the newsroom, and I've done it a couple times in my 33 years, angry about a mistake and sort of rail on somebody, always privately, it's within the next two or three days that I make some whopper of a mistake, you know? <laughs> Months prior, Zaltzberg had accepted the invitation. It timed out perfectly with his retirement as editor from the Herald Times. He would get to reminisce about the 40-plus years at the paper. But earlier in the day, the publisher of the HT, Schur's Communication, announced it was getting out of the newspaper publishing business. I have known since January 2nd. Uh, I told the staff when I, when, uh, that I was retiring on May 12th. So I'm pure and clean. It's not the kind of news that I really like having because I'm not used to keeping secrets. It's not my job. <laughs> it's not my role. Sure's Communication owns 13 publications across the state of Indiana, and that includes the 10 publications that make up the Southern Indiana Hoosier Times. But now the Herald Times will join a new publication family. Corey Bollinger is the publisher for the Hoosier Times and the vice president of Schur's Communication. He says the acquisition will benefit both Schur's and Gatehouse. They bring some tools to us, um, to the Schur's group, that's very desirable. And what I heard from Gatehouse is that they really like the markets that we serve. Gatehouse is based in New York and operates in 555 markets across 37 states. The Schur's papers will be the first papers the company has owned in Indiana. Gatehouse plans to keep Bollinger, and he will be assigned to lead the papers here in Bloomington, as well as the papers in Bedford, French Lick, West Baden, Ellettsville, Clay City, Cloverdale, Martinsville, Mooresville, Spencer, Paoli, and South Bend. He'll also take over papers in Michigan, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and South Dakota. Schurz bought the HT in 1966. The company published its first paper in South Bend in 1872. Salzburg says he thinks Gatehouse will encourage the HT to put more focus on digital publishing and media. 
Everything points to a transition to more digital. And, uh, you know, we've done it, but we've been a little slow about it. I think the new company is going to be putting a lot of pressure on doing that. And I don't think that's the wrong thing to do by any means. So, Alex, you've been covering this story throughout the week. Can you catch us up a little bit about this big transition? Yeah, so six employees of the group will not retain their jobs when Gatehouse takes ownership from Shure's communication, which is actually supposed to happen today. Now, those affected employees were informed Wednesday that that was actually their last day. So two of the employees were with the Herald Times, uh, one with the Bedford Times Mail, two with the Spencer Evening World, and then one with Orange County Publishing. Then 11 other employees were not retained at the South Bend Tribune and publications also in, also in Michigan, South Dakota, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, which were the other Shures newspapers that were sold to Gatehouse. Okay, lots going on there. Some story that we'll probably keep uh, up on. Thank you very much, yeah. Alex. Thank you, John. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. The parents of a 13-year-old boy who opened fire at Noblesville West Middle School in May say they couldn't foresee his actions and they deny any responsibility for them. The parents of Ella Whistler are seeking damages. She was shot in the face, neck, upper chest and arm. Teacher Jason Seaman ended the shooting and was shot three times in the process. Prosecutors say the boy got weapons and ammunition from a safe in the family's home and brought them to school. We're not naming the boy because he is a juvenile. He's being held in a state juvenile detention center. Two Monroe County groups are presenting a guide to help local organizations land more grant funding. Tyler Lake reports on their efforts to improve quality of place. Uh, but lots of them. Dozens of citizens uh, and members of local organizations brave the snow and frigid air to hear a new plan to attract a larger and more diverse workforce to Monroe County. The Monroe County Quality of Place and Workforce Attraction Plan is a guide for local community organizations to help them secure some of the $3 million in funding available from the Regional Opportunities Initiative. Organizers made a 30-page guidebook groups could use to pursue grants to improve the local workforce. So it's a book about what are the things that we need to work on in order to get people to move to Monroe County and stay here and work here. The plan was the product of a collaboration between the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation and the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. It's the result of a survey completed by around 2,000 area residents, six focus groups, and data collected from across Monroe County. We have a lot to offer in this community, but clearly, from what we heard tonight, we have some opportunities really to make Bloomington a more attractive place. The survey laid out issues residents would like to see addressed. Topping the list is a lack of affordable housing and high-paying jobs, new development and its effect on the local character, as well as addiction and homelessness. This really reflects from the workforce attraction um, lens some, some real needs uh, in our community. Organizations are being encouraged to focus on beautification, infrastructure, connectivity or community cohesion to be eligible for the grants. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. East Chicago residents are getting another chance to voice their concerns about the Environmental Protection Agency's cleanup at part of the USS-led Superfund site. The agency wants to remove contaminated soil from the area where the West Calumet housing complex once stood. They propose cleaning the site to residential standards unless the city takes an offer from an industrial or commercial, com commercial company. Then the site would be cleaned to a lower standard. They are extending the public comment period period on the cleanup to March 13th. While the latest cold snap may kill some of the emerald ash borer in northern states, the pests remain resilient in warmer states like Indiana. According to Purdue University, it would need to get down to about minus 28 degrees, that's without a wind chill, before the beetle starts dying off. I, you know, I don't foresee significant change or, or restriction of that bug's reproduction and spread uh, by weather events. Experts say the ash borer can survive in much colder areas like Canada. According to the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, the emerald ash borer has devastated ash trees in every county in the state. 
The longest government shutdown in history is having lasting effects on Indiana's tech economy. The Indiana Tech and Innovation Association sent a letter to Indiana members of Congress detailing the negative impacts of the shutdown on its more than 100 member companies. Bloomington-based agricultural tech startup B Corp says over $200,000 in grant funding from the National Science Foundation was out of reach during the shutdown. The grants could be delayed, and that may have an impact on the company's plans for developing and launching products. Electric scooters may finally see some statewide regulations in Indiana, but most rules will still be left to local communities. A bill approved by a House panel this week sets out a definition for electric scooters that ensures they will not be classified as motor vehicles. It also requires bike paths and trails be open to electric scooters as well. The proposal creates basic rules for scooters, including brakes and lamps on the front and back. Some cities in the state are in the process of writing their own rules governing scooter use. A local organization that provides low-cost veterinary services and pet food to those in need will move to a new building next year. The Monroe Humane Association says its current space is at capacity. When you step inside the Monroe County Humane Association's clinic on Bloomington's far west side, it quickly becomes clear the organization is running out of space. We shouldn't have food stacked in our hallways. We should have more than one restroom. We should have more than one care space. We shouldn't have to turn our x-ray room into a euthanasia suite. The demand for the low-cost services the association provides keeps increasing. It's hard to meet those needs when there are only a couple of exam rooms and no place to store supplies. And those aren't the only limitations. The nonprofit is also trying to increase its revenue. One fundraiser we've been doing here on this small space is Goat Yoga. And last year, Goat Yoga made us almost $10,000. But with such a small space, we were only able to fit so many yogis and so many goats. That will soon change. The association recently purchased nearly six and a half acres near the Monroe County Airport, where it will build a facility more than double its current size. The first phase is a 4,000 square foot animal care facility, which will be primarily the veterinary clinic and food pantry. Eventually, it'll have an additional 4,000 square feet, which will house our education and administration center. Ideally, it also has room um, for emergency housing. The first phase of the project is expected to be complete by January of next year. And Warren says that can't come soon enough. There's so many unmet needs that we're trying to meet through this one small space. And we know that those needs are just going to keep growing. The population of monarch butterflies that moves through Indiana went up by 144% last year, according to the World Wildlife Fund. Experts say one of several reasons for that is that Indiana and some other states mowed down fewer of the monarch's favored milkweed plants along highways. But while the population is up, it's still not at the level it was in the 90s. And experts say if we want more growth, the state will have to do more. And Joe, I'm ready for weather where we will see those monarch butterflies right? flying around. Exactly. Maybe more, is it milkweed plants? So if we plant more of those, you may yes, get more we'll in your see backyard. More of them. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Scott County's new sheriff is sticking with his no drug zone policy and is touting the dozens of arrests made already this year as proof. And world-class art and architecture will be coming to Southern Indiana later this year as preparation for Exhibit Columbus are underway. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! 
Yeah. I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, a new sheriff took over in Scott County at the beginning of this year and immediately promised to make the county a drug-free zone. Earlier this month, his office put together a press release titled, We Mean What We Say. It details more than a dozen drug-related arrests officers made during the first two weeks of January. The charges range from unlawful possession of a syringe to marijuana dealing. But public health advocates worry about how the aggressive stance on drugs could impact rehabilitation efforts in the county at the heart of a devastating HIV outbreak a few years ago. Reporter Barbara Brozier sat down with Sheriff Jerry Gooden to talk about his controversial approach. What challenges do you think are biggest for this community here in Scott County? Well, our challenges really are no different than any other you know, county. Obviously, we're all dealing, you know what I'm saying, with, with the drug uh, issue. Uh, and we have a plan, obviously, to battle that head on. And we think we've got a, a plan that's going to work. Uh, and, you know, coming from a small county, obviously, challenges are money. A lot of the problems and a lot of the issues that we have need money uh, to be solved or should have, you know, large amounts of money, I should say, I guess, to be solved. Uh, being a small county, we don't have the tax base and the, and the, and the uh, resources uh, to be able to do uh, what we would like to do. So we have to a lot of times go to plan B. Pretty soon after you took on this position, officially uh, took over as sheriff, you announced kind of an aggressive plan to, to tackle this drug problem. Can you tell me what the strategy is? Yeah, there? absolutely. Uh, there's, and it's, there's no secret to the strategy. We want everybody to know, you know. Uh, my very first day in office, I declared Scott County a drug-free zone, uh, basically saying that uh, we will not tolerate any drug activity. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're dealing, possessing, or whatever you're doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, we said if, if you're traveling on the interstate or you're traveling on our roadways, if you're, if you're carrying drugs, uh, we don't even want you to come through our county. Uh, we were very strong on that issue. What we told people was is that uh, you're either going to be with us or you're against us with the, with the community. And what I meant by that was is you're either going to, if you're dealing drugs, you're going to quit dealing drugs and you're going to be a part of our society and we're all going to get along well together. Or if you don't want to do that, then we ask you just to move out of the county. Just go somewhere else. And if you don't want to do those two things, then what we're going to do is we're going to arrest you. Uh, because uh, the vast majority, you know what I'm saying, the silent majority in this county said is enough's enough. And, and I feel like that's one of the reasons why that, uh, that I got elected. I uh, ran on a very aggressive platform on what I plan to do. Uh, and I'm going to follow up. A lot of people from other parts of the state, when they hear Scott County, one of the first mm -hmm. things they do think about is the HIV outbreak mm -hmm. and the, the drug use that was associated with that. And one thing that health officials have said has really helped curb that HIV outbreak is this syringe exchange that's going on. Mm -hmm. Where does that fall into this kind of aggressive strategy you have with these cracking down on the drug problems and, and arresting people who are involved in that activity when there's a syringe exchange that is legal mm -hmm. and people may be participating in? Here, here's how we answer that question is, is this. With our strategy that we have, it's not a one thing strategy where we're arresting everybody. There ain't nobody stupid enough across this whole United States to think that you can arrest yourself out of this problem, okay? We know that. Uh, part of our strategy is, is this. We are aggressively attacking drug dealers, okay? That's what we're, we're going after drug dealers, okay? Aggressively, and, and that's what we've been doing, okay? Now, not only are we aggressively going after the drug dealers, but we're aggressively, you know what I'm saying, uh, going after those folks that are doing the drugs, and here's the reason why, okay? We're gonna offer them help when they get inside this jail. We're going to start a rehab inside this jail. I've got my jail commander now. We're putting together a program, and we're going to be working with the Department of Correction. We're going to be working with our uh, local agency, CEASE here in Scott County, is what it's called, but drug uh, coalition type thing. We're working with all these entities. We're working with churches. We're working with everybody that says they've got a, a solution to this problem of addiction. Some advocacy groups do worry, though, that such an aggressive stance could put fear in some people's minds who maybe are trying to participate in the syringe exchange to prevent the spread of disease or perhaps make people afraid to even seek out help. What, what do you say to those critics? If they're not dealing drugs, what would they be afraid of? We're offering them help. We're offering them a chance to succeed. We're offering them hope. Obviously, as a law enforcement officer, I have to say and adamantly against a needle exchange. 
as a law enforcement officer, okay, and, and there's probably not too many law enforcement officers that's going to tell you that they're for a needle exchange, okay? As a law enforcement officer, strictly, I'm against the needle exchange. However, okay, however, I'll tell you this, I'm not a dum-dum, okay? And if the Surgeon General of the United States of America, who was our Surgeon General or Health uh, Advisor in Indiana at the time that said we needed a syringe exchange, if that person tells me that we need a syringe exchange, guess what? I'm not stupid enough to tell that guy who is educated, who knows exactly what they're talking about, who is that's their business. I'm not going to tell them, no, we don't need a needle exchange. Because I'm not educated enough on the subject to know if we need a needle exchange. Joining us now is Kerry Lawrence, Director of Project Cultivate in the Rural Center for AIDS STD Prevention at the IU School of Public Health. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So what do you think of the sheriff, sheriff's declaration for a drug-free zone now that you've seen the story? Um, I think my initial reaction and my first thoughts were our current attorney general, who's essentially the boss of our state law enforcement, has very similar, similar narrative. However, as Sheriff Gooden stated that, you know, we're in a public health crisis. And so things that we probably thought of a couple years ago um, in terms of, of injection drug use or substance misuse in general was that it was a, almost just a criminal justice issue and really not brought forth as a, a public health issue as much. And so... It, it was good that he at least acknowledged what Commissioner, or, or what, who was Commissioner Adams now as U.S. Surgeon General Adams um, stated is that we need a public health approach to um, this opiate crisis. Mm -hmm. So how could this aggressive approach affect some of these programs like the syringe uh, program that was mentioned mm -hmm. in the story? Well, I think he even acknowledged it, that people would be fearful of going to seek out those types of harm reduction services. And I would say from my involvement in, in harm reduction in this state, as well as other states, that my colleague Chris Apert, who runs Indiana Recovery Alliance, um, the work that we've been doing is to recognize that if we, if we start to be hard on crime specifically associated with this disease, um, people will be fearful for a, a, the, in their attempts to access services such as harm reduction, syringe exchange, um, anything else that, in which they think that they may be arrested because of the, the consequences of their disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we've seen this national shift in mindset from criminalization to rehabilitation. Right. How, how is Indiana doing, d dealing with that type of mindset change? Well, I think in terms of, um, especially FSSA is doing a really great job of making sure we are attempting to expand treatment options and coverage for treatment. However, looking at this still as an epidemic, we don't even have the infrastructure in place yet um, for everyone to have an easy access to that, those care and services. And so a lot of times our harm reduction services are, is, that, is the triage um, as well as the linkage to those services uh, primarily among a population that has been highly stigmatized. I mean, I think we, if anything, we learned that from, that was a lessons learned from a Scott County HIV outbreak is that so many times people who use drugs are hit, you know, out of the, the public eye and kind of in the shadows because of the stigma associated with the disease. Carrie. Got to cut you off there, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Exhibit Columbus recently selected the five designs that will serve as the centerpieces of this year's exhibition. As Zazra Jalen reports, the Miller Prize is inspired by J. Erwin Miller, one-time president of Cummins, Columbus native and patron of modern architecture. Exhibit Columbus, director of exhibitions and Surex says, the event will focus on honoring Miller's legacy as well as the city itself. We're taking this idea of Columbus, not just what is here as in the buildings, but why it's here. And so celebrating that community building process that was really integral to creating the city that's here today. The exhibition will connect the town's past and future with displays at sites already known for their architecture, including at the county courthouse, North Christian Church, and the community library adding this layer of temporary installation onto that and allowing another new architect to continue that story is really what we want to do with this project, where we take the past and propel it into the future. 
Perhaps the most unusual design in this year's exhibition will be growing a corn maze outside the local middle school. Surak says the local architecture tradition started off with creating interesting and well-constructed educational facilities. As a result, 14 of the 17 schools in Columbus were designed by famous architects. To honor this tradition, this year's exhibition will have a piece created by local high school students. We wanted to take that legacy of investment and highlight um, how important it is to educate people about design. And so we wanted to give voice to the students. The exhibit will start at the end of August. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Azra Jalan. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.